Nama Om Vishnu Pudaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Guruvani Pacharine Nirvise Sasunyavadi Paskatya Desatarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhuni Chananda Sri Vaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Guru Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Sila Prabhupada Ki Jesh, Shimad Bhagavad Gita Grantaraj Ki Jesh. Shimad Bhagavatam Grantaraj Ki Jesh. Go to Primanandi, Hare Bo, Hare Bo. Okay, so today we're going to go over some of the homework that you've done. And I got homework from Shitan and from Sun Mook and also Shrestha. Okay, one second. Okay, so I think I'm going to read Shanmuk Prabhu's homework. And the homework is, explain the difference between the material mood of goodness. It should be material mode, not mood, M-O-D-E, of goodness, and the transcendental mode of goodness. Also explain the difference between the vision of a person in the material and transcendental mode of goodness. Uh, so it should be the difference between the vision of a person in the material mode of goodness as opposed to the transcendental mode of goodness. It should be written like that. Include examples from the Amish and Vrindavan communities. Okay, so the Amish community in the material world and Vrindavan community in the spiritual world. Okay. So, it's an interesting homework. Well, let's see what Sun Mook says. He begins, material mode of goodness. In the Bhagavad Gita 14th chapter 6 verse, it states, Tratrasatvam nirmalatvat Pada, padasakam anamayam sukha sangena badnati jnana sangena chanaga. O sinless one, the mode of goodness, being purer than the others, is illuminating, and it frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode become conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. <clears throat> Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Oh, actually, Sun Mook writes, I'm sorry. Prabhupada in the purport to this verse gives a very detailed explanation on the mode of goodness. Prabhupada starts by saying, that by the development of the mo material mode of goodness, one, uh, by the development of the material mode of goodness can make one wiser than others, not affected by the miseries, but he only has a sense to advance in material knowledge. Hmm. But Prabhupada later states, the difficulty here is that when a living entity is situated in the mode of goodness, he becomes conditioned to feel that he is advanced in knowledge and is better than others. In this way, he becomes conditioned. The best examples are the scientist and the philosopher. 
The mundane philosophers and scientists are conditioned due to being proud of the knowledge that they have, which can cause temporary happiness, and therefore they become conditioned. A few characteristics of those situated in the material mode of goodness are makes distinctions. They rejoice and lament for pleasant and unpleasant reactions. Attracted to sense pleasure. Not learned in the perfect knowledge. Believe that our duty in this world is to enjoy. Illusion by the identification of the body. Therefore, the material mode of goodness is also a cause of material bondage and one should come to the platform of pure goodness, Sudha Sattva Guna, Prabhupada states, the mode of goodness gives an aspect of stability, purity, peace, wisdom, and truth to our mental state, the type of body we have, and even the weather. <laughs> when the material mode of goodness is used in the service of the Lord, it does, doesn't become an obstacle for spiritual realization but instead helps us to further progress in the, spiritual, in the spiritual life and attain pure goodness. In the material modes of nature, the highest mode is the mode of goodness, but one must transcend all the modes of nature and be situated in pure goodness. Prabhupada states that when one comes on this stage, then one is perfect in Krishna consciousness. Now, that's the mode of goodness. Now he writes, transcendental mode of goodness. Prabhupada, in one of his morning walk, compares wood to tamoguna, tamoguna, smoke to rajaguna, and fire to sattvaguna, and sudha sattvaguna to blazing fire. Prabhupada continues by saying that there are two platforms in the Sudha Sattva Guna, which are everlasting Sudha Sattva Guna or blazing fire, which can be attained in the spiritual platform, in the material platform, where the blazing fire can be easily extinguished. Mm. Okay. Prabhupada in his lecture states <clears throat> In this material world, even Sattva Guna <coughs> is sometimes contacted with is sometimes contact, contacted with Rajaguna and Tamaguna. Therefore, it is not completely pure. No guna is pure. It is mixed up always. That is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. So one has to transcend these gunas. Then God realization or the understanding of Krishna can be achieved. But the devotional service Vidhi Bhakti, the process of rendering devotional service to the Lord according to the prescribed regulative principles in the Shastra helps us to transcend all these qualities. Therefore, so that's the end of quote. Then now Sun Book writes, therefore, the process of devotional service and chanting are very essential in order to achieve the everlasting transcendental mode of goodness. Correct. Prabhupada, in his lecture at Vrindavan on September 3, 1975, gives an example of a person situated in the Sutta Sattva Guna. Quote by Srila Prabhupada. But we see the behavior of Haridas Thakura. Because he was situated on the Sutta Sattva Guna, and although he was a young man, one young prostitute, came to deviate him, and he remained in his position. Rather, he converted the prostitute to become a devotee. This is the difference between sattva guna and suddha sattva guna. If you keep yourself on the suddha sattva guna level, then you will be able to convert others to become devotees. Therefore, it is not difficult. It is very easy also, Krishna says. Mam chaya vibhicharini bhakti yogena sevate ya sevate sagunam samatitya itan brahma buyaya kalpate. The brahma buyaya 
This Brahma Bhuya means Sudha Sattva. That is also in Sudha Sattva Guna that a liberated, uh, uh, which is a liberated stage. If you do not stick to devotional service, then there is chance of fall down also. So without taking to the devotional service life, uh, without taking to devotional service, life is very, very risky. Risky means now we can dance and laugh because we have got this human form of life, but after death, we do not know. Prabhupada, in this purport, so that was a quote, and then Sanmuk says, Prabhupada, in his purport to teachings of Queen Kunti, chapter 4 states, the, to understand the Supreme Lord, this is a quote, to understand the Supreme Lord, we must first come to the platform of sattva, or goodness, sattva guna, meaning goodness. But goodness here in the material world is sometimes contaminated by the lower qualities, ignorance and passion. By hearing about Krishna, however, one comes to the platform of pure goodness, Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana. Therefore, one must try to follow the below principles in order to attain the, the pure goodness. One, waking up in Brahma Muhurta. Two, thinking of the Lord and his pastimes. Three, associating with pure devotees. Four, reading scriptures in the pr pursuance of the Vedic literature. Five, chanting the holy name. Six, performing devotional service. Characteristics of those situated in Sudha Sattva Guna are a person is situated in equanimity, Bhagavad Gita 5.18. They never rejoice and lament for pleasant and unpleasant reactions, Bhagavad Gita 5.20. Free from material contamination. Learned or learned in the science of God, Bhagavad Gita 5.20. Understands that we are not the body, but the soul. Knows that we are the part and parcel of Krishna, and our duty is to serve him eternally. It's the purport to Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 13, 54. Attained unlimited happiness, Bhagavad Gita 5.21. Never in search of sense pleasure, instead applies the senses to serve Krishna, Bhagavad Gita 5.22. Here is a table on the difference between the Amish and the Vrindavan community. So Amish in the material world and the Vrindavan community in the spiritual world. Okay, it says, Amish acts in the bodily concept of life. Example, marry only those who follow the Amish religion. Okay, Vrindavan community acts based on the concept of soul. Example, treat everyone equally because there is Paramatma in everyone. Okay. Two, Amish services every Sunday. Vrindavan community every second is used in the service of the Lord. Hmm. I see what you mean. You're mixing up service, meaning they go to church every Sunday. And then, so you're using the word service in the sense of going to church. And then, it's a Vrindavan community. Every second is used in the service of of the Lord, uh, yes, but uh, in other words, you, you, what you're implying here is they only serve God once a week when they go to church. The rest of the time, they're not serving God. Uh, and in the Vrindavan community, they're serving Krishna 24 hours a day. Okay, you could say that. You could say that. But, uh, hmm. I have a little problem with that, but it's you're you're actually right. Okay, let me think about that a little bit more. In other words, you're implying that the rest they just serve God when they go to church in the Amish community, 
but the rest of the week they're not serving God. Ah, I'm not sure if you could say that. Uh, depends. But definitely the people in Vrindavan and spiritual are serving Krishna every day. That's for sure. And all day, 24 hours a day. Okay, number three, reject modern technology. Example, rejecting tractors. Using modern, te so that's the Amish, and then you're saying in Vrindavan, using modern technology in the service of the Lord. Well, theoretically, that's true. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, anything that can be used in the service of the Lord should not be rejected. Okay, and then let's see. Amish community, no association with non-Amish. Vrindavan community, limited association with non-devotees, but limited association is to make the non-devotees Krishna conscious. Okay. Of course, there's no, so no possibility of associating with non-devotees in the spiritual world because everyone's a devotee there. Uh, so in other words, when, we're, when you're writing about the Vrindavan community, you, you, it doesn't matter whether it's Vrindavan in this world or Vrindavan in the spiritual world. It's just the, uh, the mentality of transcendentally situated people. Okay, so in that sense, it's correct. Five, uh, the Amish, raise animals for meat. And five, Vrindavan community, raise animals to protect them from getting slaughtered. Okay. And that's six, the Amish community, very much attached to family life. Number six, uh, for Vrindavan, as a family, they progress in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, okay. So it's not, they're not really attached to mundane family life because everyone in the family is, is engaged in the service of Krishna. And then number seven, in the Amish, their only goal is to make it to heaven, which they can if they abide by these four conditions. And they're just gonna state the four conditions. And uh, number seven in the Vrindavan community, ultimate goal is to satisfy Krishna by performing devotional service. Okay. So then in the Amish, these four things, they live a mostly ultra-Orthodox lifestyle as their Jewish forefather ancestry. Okay, well, all right. In other words, they live an ultra-Orthodox lifestyle. Believe Jesus is Messiah and ask Christ to forgive their sins. That they get baptized when they mature enough to make that decision. They act in the humble manner described in the Jewish New Year of Rosh Hashanah celebration. Hmm. Believe in Jesus who is the Son of God. And in Vrindavan, community, believe in the Supreme Person of Godhead, the Absolute Krishna. Okay, in other words, you're, you're, you're comparing the Amish to the Vrindavan community and spiritual world. They have to do these four things. Hmm. Okay, you must have read that somewhere and you wrote those four things down. Fine. Well, devotees also do four things. They chant Hare Krishna, they associate with devotees, they engage in deity worship, they have only, they accept only Mahaprasadam, and they uh, regularly hear Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so Sanmok, pretty good. Thank you very much. That's a pretty good answer to the question. And you did some research, which is very excellent. So thank you. Hare Krishna. So let's uh, now read uh, Shritan. So Shritan's homework. 
explain the difference between the material mode of goodness and the transcendental mode of goodness using the examples of the Amish communities and the Vrindavan community, meaning Vrindavan and the spiritual world, hint. Sankirtana is the most important activity for Krishna consciousness. Very good. It's good that you wrote down the little more details about the question. And then you write down references, descriptions of Vrindavan from the Krishna book, descriptions of Sankirtan from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhagavad Gita 5, 18 to 22, Bhagavad Gita 6.9, and Srimad Bhagavatam 113.54. Okay. And Sritan writes, the material mode of goodness is another way to say morality. Morality in this world is just providing the rights it's just providing the rights of liberty, uh, of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have a little problem with that statement, but it's right in one sense, but it uh, could be somewhat misleading in another sense. We'll come back to this. In other words, respecting others' rights to right to their lives, no, the right to live. Okay, good. On the other hand, we have the spiritual mode of goodness, which is morality according to the scriptures, which are perfect due to being written by a perfect creator. People in the spiritual mode of goodness are internally happy by taking pleasure from Krishna, as stated, as said in Bhagavad Gita verse 521, enjoying pleasure within. In this way, the self-realized person enjoys unlimited happiness, where he concentrates on the supreme. Okay. The conclusion that can be drawn from this translation from the Bhagavad Gita is that material things don't offer a solution to happiness. Correct. We can confirm this by the following verse, which states that such places have a beginning and an end, and so the wise man does not delight in them. Good. Very good that you quoted that. The material mode of goodness has to do with material bondage, as said in the purport 5.13.54, Bhagavatam. This is still material happiness, although it is the best mode of the three, which includes passion and ignorance. Okay. The spiritual mode of goodness, however, provides unlimited happiness, as said in 521. Okay. This is why wise people perform devotional service to push themselves in this path of remembrance of Krishna. An example of a community living in the material mode of goodness would be the Amish. The Amish live a nonchalant lifestyle not succumbing to the modern ways of life. Rather, they spend their time farming and providing their own sustenance with hard work. Their motive is to have a peaceful and happy life by living in a rustic environment to better suit their needs. The Vrindavan way of life is live, livelier, although it includes the same methods of survival. The people of Vrindavan perform religious activities to please Krishna unlike the Amish whose main purpose is to provide sustenance for the present and future and not their religion. The Amish have all their senses engaged in work. The people of Vrindavan have all their senses focusing on Krishna, although they are also working. The mode of goodness is still material and the goal is to transcend the influence and the goal is to transcend the influence of all the modes and surrender unto the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Okay, well, Shitan, nice try. And some of this is very well said. Uh, when you come to the end, let's see, uh, there's a couple problems. Not serious problems, but a few problems. You say the Vrindavan way of life is livelier, although it, although it includes the same methods of survival. The people of Vrindavan perform religious activities to please Krishna, unlike the Amish, whose main purpose is to provide sustenance 
for the present and future and not their religion. That, I have a problem with that statement. Uh, statement is, uh, what, you can say it's a half, uh, half right. The whole purpose of the Amish is to follow their religion. That's why they came to America. That's why they refuse to accept any modern amenities. That's why they stay in community. And uh, you say the Amish have all their senses engaged in work. The people of Vrindavan have all their senses focusing on Krishna, although they are also working. The mode of goodness is still material. The goal is to transcend the influence of all modes and surrender unto the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. That's correct. But um, you're not being fair to the Amish uh, in some ways. Okay. But anyway, I'm, you did good homework. Thank you very much, Shitan. Okay, now let's read Shrestha's homework. Uh, assignment. Explain the difference between the material mode of goodness and the transcendental mode of goodness using the examples of the Amish communities in the material world and the ideal community in Goloka Vrindavan. You should say Goloka Vrindavan just so we understand which Vrindavan you're talking about. Actually, there's no difference between Goloka Vrindavan and Gokula or Vrindavan in the material world. Hint, Sankirtan is the most important activity for Krishna consciousness. So here is something that both Sanmuk and Sritan did not touch on, although that was part of the homework, a hint to understand the main difference. And we'll explain that more. Let's see what Sh uh, Shrestha says. Reference verses, description of Vrindavan from Krishna book, descriptions of Sankirtana from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and then Bhagavad Gita 5, 18 to 22, Bhagavad Gita 6.9, and Srimad Bhagavatam 113, 54. Okay. So it says, so Shrestha says, we are all well aware of the three modes of material nature, ignorance, passion, and goodness. Beyond those modes, however, is the transcendental mode of goodness. Many people cannot understand this difference between goodness and transcendental goodness. Very good sentence, very good point. This is why many people, although having good moral standards and following religion, are actually not Krishna conscious. Correct. The perfect examples we can use to understand the difference between the material mode of goodness and the transcendental mode of goodness are the Amish communities in the material world and the ideal community, Goloka Vrindavana. Below is a chart I have included to explain the characteristics of the Amish communities and also the characteristics of the Vrindavan community. So both. Sanmuk and Shrestha have made a chart. So let's see what uh, Shrestha's chart says. Amish communities, mode of goodness. By the way, because the Amish eat meat, for the most part, I'm not sure if there are vegetarians amongst the Amish. I don't want to be unfair. I just have to say I'm not sure about that. Uh, but my understanding is that they are meat eaters. Let, let, let's, let's look that up. Let's see if, what it says about that. One second. I just want to... See, uh, both uh, Sanmuk and Shritan both made the point that the mode of goodness is not pure. The material mode of goodness is not pure. There, it, is, it is influenced or mixed with passion and ignorance. Okay, so let's see. Amish main meals are usually built around hearty meat dishes. Whoa. Such as pork chops, ham, roast beef, or meatloaf. 
Most Amish families keep at least a few chickens so they can eat freshly laid eggs all year round. Well, that's just eliminated the Amish from the mode of goodness. <laughs> well, in other words, some of the things they do is in the mode of goodness. That's definitely a fact. But it's, they have a good, good mixture or a good percentage of mixture with the mode of passion and ignorance also, unfortunately for them. Whereas the residents of Vrindavan uh, in the spiritual world are strictly uh, the vegetarian. They only eat uh, food offered to Krishna. So that's a major, major difference between the mixed mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance as opposed to Visuddha Sad for a transcendental goodness. Okay, so let's continue with uh, Shrestha's homework. She says, Amish communities mode of goodness. There are two types of Amish communities. One, the old order Mennonites. These communities do accept the use of technology. And then Two, the old order Amish. These communities don't accept the use of technology. Okay. And, and then it says, the Amish immigrated to Pennsylvania from Europe. They speak unique dialects of German and Dutch. Every year in Amish communities, the people come together with the church, church priests and bishops to decide the ordnung, the rules of the church. Every year? That's interesting. The ordnung has all kinds of rules that apply to daily life, clothing, requirements, regulation of the use of technology, etc. The Amish diet. The Amish people are meat eaters, and they eat cows and other livestock. Next, Amish life. I'm glad uh, Shrestha is writing all this down because this is very important to understand that the mode of goodness practiced in the material world is usually adulterated with passion and ignorance. It's not actually the pure mode of goodness. Amish lifestyle, heavily focused on agriculture and rural lifestyle, often reject opulence and live very simply. True. The Amish people are partly focused on their religious practices. Every two weeks, the community meets in one of the houses to worship. Amish people refuse modern education, which is very good, and only educate children formally up to the age of 13 or 14. Sometimes children do go outside to take higher education, but for the purpose of taking doctor roles in the community. The Amish people are also pacifists, very important point, which means that they are peace lovers. They never fight back when something happens to them. They never join the army or engage in combat. They prefer manual labor as the use, uh, since the use of technology can make people lazy. Good point. Amish families usually have around six children. When the children grow up to be teenagers, they're given the opportunity to choose what they want in their life. They can decide between life outside the Amish or to stick to the Amish community. Most of them stick to the Amish community. The Amish people maintain a distance from the rest of the world, yet they are growing rapidly. The three main reasons that the Amish community still exists, they refuse modern secular education. Very good point. They embrace their unique language. Good. They live according to their faith in the church. Okay, that's a fair representation in the Amish community, uh, which is a, uh, let's say, a close, a somewhat close facsimile of people in the material world in the mode of goodness, but nothing is pure in the material world, so they also have ignorant and passionate activities also, such as killing the cow and other animals and eating them. And, and then we'll, we'll look more deeply in a second. So now, the Vrindavan transcendent community and spiritual world uh, an example of transcendental goodness as opposed to mundane goodness. Vrindavan is the ideal Krishna conscious society. The main activities for humans 
or let's say liberated souls, you should say liberated souls in Vrindavan are, one, producing grains and crops, agriculture. Two, protecting the cows. Three, banking and transporting food. Okay. So you say the main activities for humans in Vrindavan are, well, uh, you would say, see, Vrindavan is, in the spiritual world is, is, is eternal, so they don't have to really worry about maintaining themselves, but they do uh, engage in producing grains and crops, protecting cows, and so forth. In Vrindavan, all living entities are treated like the children of God, and therefore everyone has the right to live. Well, they're all eternal, so they don't have to worry about living. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Uh, so let, let's say you're writing, uh, I can I can understand what Shrestha is doing. She's sort of mixing the two, Vrindavan is spiritual, Vrindavan in the material world. So let, let's stick to her point here, and, and she's explaining Vrindavan in the material world. Next, the general economic status of the entire caste system is dependent on the Vaishyas or the merchants. Well, Vaishyas are not only merchants, they're also, their number one goal is protecting cows and producing grains and then uh, distributing them either charitably or otherwise for the welfare of the other three classes of people. <clears throat> okay. So therefore, Vrindavan, although not a metropolis, was filled with its own opulence. Green grasses and trees, flowing rivers, and clean rivers, right? Thriving cows and other animals, jewels and pearls, abundance of crop and milk products, abundance of rain, etc. Okay, that's because they're all devotees and they're not engaged in any sinful activities and they're uh, always worshiping Krishna. Next, economy should always be measured in terms of the protection of cows and the cultivation of land. Okay, the, the people of Vrindavan placed a heavy focus on emphasis in taking care of the cows. Most of the men were cow herders. Okay, the people of Vrindavan do not reject opulence. Rather, they use that opulence in the service of the Lord. Very good point. Everyone in Vrindavan, even animals and trees, were full of readiness to sacrifice everything for the Lord, correct? They are also always spreading the glories of the Lord and Krishna consciousness. There are many examples where we can observe the pure consciousness of the inhabitants of Vrindavana. Rohini Devi, the mother of Balaram, dressed herself nicely on the occasion of Krishna's birth ceremony to please the Lord, even though her husband was away from home. Nanda Maharaj immediately took shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead when he heard from Vasudeva that there would be some disturbances in Vrindavana. The gopis constantly spoke the pastimes of Lord Krishna with each other. So this is a, examples of pure consciousness of the inhabitants of Vrindavana. The people of Vrindavana were not focused on the material religious life, that is, kaitava dharma. Their sole purpose was to please the Lord. Although they worshipped the sun god and other demigods, their entire purpose was to please Krishna. Okay. So, all three homeworks, uh, Shrestha, Shritan, and uh, Sanmuk, uh, although they mentioned, oh, Shrestha mentioned a hint about Sankirtan, she didn't write about it. Uh, she did mention a little something about it, maybe. Uh, let's see. What did she say? Not really. She didn't really go into it. Okay. So the major difference between the Amish community and the material world, besides the fact that they eat meat and kill animals, or cows, etc., and the Vrindavan community in the spiritual world or in the material world uh, is that in the Vrindavan community, they're always chanting the glories of the Lord. And they're engaged in 
uh, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu exhibited, Sankirtan Yagya, that the real, uh, say, prescribed uh, duty of all the inhabitants is to chant the names of Krishna and 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 chant the pastimes and glorification of the Lord for the benefit of everyone. Whereas the Amish community, they're mostly concerned about their own community. They're not trying to proselytize. You should look this word up, proselytize. Um, it means they're not interested in preaching outside of their community. So this is a major, major difference in the idea of the Vrindavan community is they want to spread the glories of the Lord to everyone, whether they're good people or bad people, whereas the Amish are avoiding, if they can, the association of outside people to their community. They're more interested in their own community and they stay amongst themselves. So, therefore, Sankirtan is the difference. They're not in, engaged in Sankirtan, the congregational chanting of the holy name in public. They're more interested in their own community based on a material concept of life. And, and Shrestha mentioned some of those things. They, they have their own language, and they don't engage in... Uh, associating much or at all with outside people as much as possible. Now, they have some good behaviors, but see, the fact that they're pacifists, in other words, means uh, they're peace lovers, but more than that, they refuse to go into the army, they uh, avoid, well, if they're attacked, they will not... Uh, this is theoretical now. They're, they're, theoretically, they will not try and protect themselves. Well, that's not the case in Rindavan. You, you, you can see in Goloka Rindavan, in, in, in Gokula Rindavan, in the material world, demons come into Rindavan to try and kill Krishna, and Krishna kills them. So, uh, this... Uh, you can't say Krishna is not a pacifist uh, because he won't even kill an ant. But yet, if the inhabitants are attacked, like just like uh, the Kaliya serpent tried to consume everybody with fire, and Indra tried to kill everybody with uh, torrents of rain, and Krishna protected in both cases. He, he, drank, he sort of ate all the fire or consumed all the fire himself to save the cowherd boys. And then he also uh, lifted Govardhan Hill to save the inhabitants from the tor torrential rains caused by Indra. So that's a major difference. So, but the most important difference is Sankirtan because the, the Amish have no interest at all in preaching outside their community, whereas the devotees will take all risks on behalf, behalf of Krishna to spread the glories of the holy name and knowledge of Krishna. So, okay. So that's the difference between the transcendental mode of goodness and the mundane mode of goodness. Mundane mode of goodness is concerned with preserving or, uh, or or in some way or other sustaining as, as much as possible uh, material happiness in this world. And that, of course, is impossible, but yet they make a s strong attempt at it. And they, unfortunately, become proud of their opulence and their uh, type of community where there's mostly goodness, but goodness often with the purpose of preserving material happiness and uh, prosperity. Therefore, in the uh, church today in, in America, you have 
ministers preaching what's called prosperity theology. So now I want you to look that word up. Prosperity, P-R-O-S-P-E-R-I-T-Y. I think that's what it's spelled. Prosperity theology, C-H-E-O-L-O-G-Y, or prosperity gospel, G-O-S-P-E-L. And there's a minister, I think he's in Texas, called Austin, O-S-T-E-E-N, and he's a great proponent of prosperity theology, and it's a completely mundane uh, material thing. You know, the idea God wants you to be rich. Well, uh, by preaching that, he gets people to give him big donations so that the real person that gets rich is Mr. Austin, <laughs> as opposed to everybody in the community. But everybody in the community uh, is following their religion, but one of the main reasons is to become rich and prosperous and, and thereby happy and thereby uh, it's part of their religion, the practice of Christianity. Of course, it has nothing to do with Christianity. Jesus himself was not a rich man. He didn't try to be. Uh, but anyway, so you see how things get mixed in with the religion through practicing the mode of goodness for material benefit. Okay, so the major difference is that uh, the uh, Amish have a materialistic attachment to family and to, let's say, let's say, say race and ethnicity and follow religion in the sense of kaitava dharma. Look this word up, kaitava, K-A-I-T-A-V-E, or kaitavo, K-A-I-T-A-V-O, which means following religion for material purpose of maintaining family relationships and making it generational, and uh, even in a sense of, uh, yeah, and also uh, following religion for a material purpose, uh, you know, maintaining their community, maintaining their material identity, and so forth, and uh, and not really spreading the word of God, but keeping it within their own uh, community. So they have a strong materialistic, uh, let's say, uh, orientation for their spiritual activities and spiritual uh, endeavors. Whereas in Krishna consciousness, in the Vrindavan, let's say, community, it's full of happiness, of course, but not based on the body. It's based on service to Krishna. They're not seeking material opulence, but they have natural opulence because they're engaged in cow protection and they respect brahmanas and they uh, uh, chant the holy names of the Lord, always remember the pastimes of the Lord. In other words, that's their real activity. It's not farming per se, but it's glorifying Krishna and always being dependent on the mercy of Krishna. Now, the, the Amish uh, pray to God on a regular basis every day. They read the Bible every day. Uh, so it's not that... There, there's nothing in their life is in the mode of goodness. You know, many things in their life is in the mode of goodness, but there's an admixture or there's a mixture of mode of passion and ignorance. Meat eating is definitely in the mode of ignorance, no doubt about it. So the fact that they can't see that, in the same way they say they're pacifists, they believe in peace, but there's no peace for their animals uh, who finally end up on their plate. So, uh, the, there, uh, there are a lot of things that are, let's say, lacking in the Amish community as compared to the Vrindavan community. And, okay, so this was an interesting homework today. To understand the difference between the mode of, material mode of goodness 
and the transcendental mode of goodness. The difference between sattva guna and visuddha sattva guna, or uh, or uh, uh, transcendental goodness. But the main difference is sankirtan, because the devotees will go out and preach to everyone, it's knowing the fact that everyone has an eternal relationship with Krishna. That is extremely important, the most important thing. Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement is very, very special because it's meant for all living entities, not just human beings, but all living entities, because all living entities are part and parcel of Krishna. Whether they're aquatics or reptiles or insects or birds or fish or uh, mammals or plants or uh, human beings. They're all members of, uh, they're all part of Krishna's family. And so that's the universal vision of the presence of Paramatma and of Krishna as the source of everything. So everything has a relationship to Krishna. Whereas when you have a bodily, let's say, identification, you don't see, you might theoretically understand or say things, but you don't actually practically practice the fact that everything has an eternal relationship with Krishna. Therefore, one's renunciation is incomplete. There are many things they could use in the service of the Lord that they don't due to their imperfect understanding of Krishna uh, being present in everything. Okay, so that was our homework for today. So, to, so now for tomorrow, I'm gonna give a very interesting homework. Anyway, I wanna thank both Sritan, Sanmuk, and Shrestha for doing their homework and, and they, all three did uh, made a good try and and and, uh, and there was just but the hint I gave was the main point the Amish are not concerned about everyone else they're only concerned about themselves because they have a bodily conception of their uh, let's say uh, bodily conception of uh, their position in this material world rather than a, a pure spiritual perception that's why their mode of goodness is mixed with passion and ignorance whereas the residents of Vrindavan have a transcendental understanding of, of their eternal relationship with Krishna and all living entities and oh another example I didn't give that hint but I should have is Govardhan Puja in which all living entities are supposed to be fed even the snakes that's another example of transcendental goodness a very strong example Okay, so taking that into event, into consideration, uh, one, uh, one homework for tomorrow is to read about Govardhan Puja in the Krishna book or in the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam and give practical example. Um, for example, uh, Shrestha tried to do that. Give practical example of the Vrindavan communal life and point out the universal aspects, universal transcendental aspects of it, okay? So that would be even going deeper into understanding the Visuddha Sattva stage as opposed to the mundane stage of, of goodness. So you read the chapter in the Krishna book about Govardhan Puja and extract out of it uh, characteristics of the transcendental communal life in the spiritual world as opposed, and then if you want, you can uh, just oppose that, just oppose is a good word, you can look it up, to life in a mundane spiritual community or a mundane mode of goodness living. 
Okay, that's your homework for tomorrow. You read about Govardhan Puja, and you extract out the characteristics of the of Govardhan Puja in the, in, in the Vrindavan community, uh, and uh, as as uh, as compared to the mundane mode of goodness community. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions that you may have? Anything coming in? Nothing? Okay. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.